We turn now from sort of straight on archaeology. Actually, Leslie made us started this transition to more cultural anthropology and hearing directly from some of our tribal friends. And that's what we're going to be exploring this afternoon. Uh, so I'm going to introduce our speakers, but I wanted to let you know, if you hadn't seen it, um, Alec Awali, who's the curator of North American Anthropology at the Field Museum, and Eli, um, uh, were mentioned in, were quoted in an article, front page of the Chicago Tribune this week, talking about the commitment and the change that the Field Museum is making in their Native American exhibit, which dates from the 1950s. It's the oldest exhibit they have. I, maybe that's not the right way to say it. It's the least updated exhibit they have. How does that sound? Of their collections. And uh, so Alec is going to be speaking about that, but it made front page of the Tribune this week, and that's how important it's being seen, in, at least in the Chicago circles. So Alec Awali uh, received her bachelor's degree at Harvard and her PhD at Columbia, her master's and PhD at Columbia in cultural anthropology. Her research has been uh, largely focused on Central and South America and looking at contemporary indigenous peoples uh, and how development is changing their cultures or affecting their cultures. In 1995, she joined the Field Museum uh, as, uh, with the Center for Cultural Understanding. And um, she's working currently to better engage urban South American uh, indigenous people in environmental conservation, the work that we do here at JDCF, similar to that. And again, she's the cura currently the curator of North American anthropology for the Field Museum. Um, her partner, Eli Sukovich, was trained in undergrad at UIC, and he received his master's and PhD from University of Montana. He specializes in ethnobiology and has really been helping Alica reach out to the many, they, Again, the Field Museum is working across North America, not just in the Midwest tribal groups, but across North America. And Eli has been really specializing and focusing in Chicago and Midwest tribal groups. So what an honor it is to have both of you from the Field Museum, and I'm going to introduce to you Alec Awali and Eli Sukovich. I'm not a pacer, so <laughs> hopefully this will pick us up. But um, thank you, Steve, and thank you to the Joe Davies Conservation Fund for hosting this really important symposium that comes at a really good time uh, in our nation's history. Uh, it's a time, and this is kind of why I'll explain to you the Field Museum finally is updating this Native American hall, uh, which as Steve mentioned, has really not changed since the 1950s. Um, thank you. I don't, okay. And so um, the, um, I'm going to uh, talk about how we are approaching the renovation of this hall. So. We are shifting gears now for the afternoon from talking about the past and the history and the heritage of this region particularly and of native peoples and how they shape the landscape to thinking about more current issues. But there is a continuity between the past and the present. And I think there's also a continuity I think you heard this in Phil and Tim and uh, Leslie's presentation. Um, what I love about being a cultural anthropologist and a scientist is that science can change, and that's the beauty of it. And the way that we scientists 
um, are able to understand that maybe some of the theories and perspectives that we had, you know, back in the day of the 1950s, say, when this hall was made or when the Field Museum was founded, do not hold up against the evidence that we continue to gather and, and uh, through our research, through our uh, conversations with people and so on. So I think what you saw here today that was so important was the kind of major shift that's occurring in the field of archaeology and anthropology because we realized that you know, what had been the old way of doing things, which is this notion that you could sort of, um, I, think, I, I think Steve characterized it as, as science, you know, sort of uh, do science in a particular narrow way does not help us understand the richness of evidence that's out there that helps us to explain both the past and the current ways that human social behavior um, you know, happens, the way people live. And so I think the, the science of anthropology is expanding to include other lines of evidence than just you know, thinking through what it is the way we used to, as Leslie did such a good job of, of um, explaining. And so it's not that the science and the other ways of knowing are that separate. It's that there is now finally a really exciting way in which different ways of thinking, different ways of understanding are coming together to create a more richer and um, I think more truthful and more complex narrative of how we understand our world today and that that kind of applies to everything. And it's not just about the particular topic that we're talking about. So I just wanted to make that. And so it's a nice, I feel like a great bridge between the morning and the afternoon, um, the con continuity rather than the separation. Does that, that make sense? So moving on. So. I came to the Field Museum in 1995, and I was, um, felt very fortunate to come and join an institution. I'm not a museum anthropologist by training. I was trained as an applied anthropologist, which meant that I was interested in seeing how anthropology could be used to help solve problems that we face today. And I started my career, as Steve mentioned, working with indigenous peoples in Central and South America and looking at how their lives had been altered by modernity, by industrial development and displacement from their land. And then I started doing urban anthropology. So when I came to the Field Museum, I didn't really know much about how you can do this stuff out of a museum. And over the past 20 years or so, uh, we've been really working to make the Field Museum a place where it's not just about the old mummies and the old dinosaurs, but it is a place where the knowledge that we have, the expertise that we have, um, and the collections that we have can speak to issues that are of concern to all of us today. How do we do that? How do we bring that knowledge into action. And that's the work I've been doing at the Field Museum, and it's particularly around issues of environmental conservation. But then in uh, 2012, I think, I, I assumed responsibility for curating the North American collection. And the North American collection um, at the Field Museum is truly one of the best collections of North American material um, in the world. Um, so the, it is only three hours away from here. Um, so you have at your, in your neighborhood, if you will, this amazing collection of um, the life ways of people um, that were, was built, um, you know, since the beginning of the Field Museum. We're celebrating our 125th 
um, anniversary now. So um, yeah, 120 years, over 120 years, and it's still growing. It's 700,000 artifacts, including the archeological and the ethnographic collections, about 70,000 ethnographic collections, which means from the late 19th century forward. Um, and it is the leading scholarly authority, the Field Museum, on this cultural heritage and diversity of North Native groups in the United States and Canada. So, so it's a big responsibility <laughs> that I feel uh, as a curator of that collection to think about how do we um, you know, make sure that we are worthy of having in trust this heritage um, and how do we begin to rethink the way that we bring the knowledge that the collections hold to our public, to our visitors. And that's the project that we've uh, embarked upon. I'm just going to show you some of the highlights uh, of the collection. And um, as uh, Steve said, we uh, have collections from across Canada and the United States. So um, from the north, northwest, um, California, the west, the Southwest, the Plains, the Great Plains, and so the Plains collection is one of our strengths, um, for sure. So is the Southwest. Um, this is, uh, and this is from our own, very own region here, the Midwest. Um, so it's a really, um, I don't know, I can't really describe in words how spectacular the collection is. So the question is, and then since I've been the curator, we started building an urban collection because, you know, um, well, you, you, you hear, here you're in a more rural part of the state, but over 50% of our world's population now I think it's even over 60% live in cities. So if we're gonna be, as anthropologists at the Field Museum, if we're gonna reflect on the way people live today, we have to represent life in the urban context. And Native peoples have been living in urban uh, milieus, have been part of the urban environment, and you're gonna hear a little bit from Eli about that. Um, since the early parts of the 20th century, I think. And so it doesn't make sense not to represent that in our collection. So I started making a collection of urban powwow regalia. It's still small, but it's, you know, there's a lot of potential there. And I think we're gonna hear uh, about regalia and the importance of regalia for ceremony as well as for powwow from uh, speakers later on today. So. Um, but here's the dilemma we face. This is the Hall of Native North America, um, as it was until about just two years ago when we started doing a little work on it. And as you can see, it's a very um, mid 20th century representation of Native life, of Native peoples. It, the main uh, theory that was uh, governing the way that native life was, uh, native people's life was depicted back then was the notion that this way of life was going to vanish, that assimilation was going to happen, that people were going to change. And so we have to, we the museum have to display how their life was. Um, so that it isn't lost to history. And so a lot of the um, way in which the hall has depicted and represented Native life ways is as if they were frozen in time, as if people were frozen in time. And uh, there's very little um, context given to the life, you know, there's just a lot of objects and cases. There's about 1,400 objects 
in the call currently. Um, and so it was uh, very problematic. And the other problem is that in the hall is that when it was mounted in the 1950s, the techniques for conservation and care of the collections also was not um, what we would consider best practice today. And so the, a lot of the objects are tacked to the walls, um, you know, to the back of the cases. They're mounted upside down and, um, you know, generally um, it's not great. This is one of my um, gut-wrenching, um, when I saw this, uh, it is, this is a hide painting by a very famous uh, Kiowa artist, Silverhorn, um, who was well known in, in the 1930s, 1940s, or, or, and earlier. And, um, you know, this is an amazing piece of art uh, work. And um, I'm president of the Field Museum has said it, it is the equivalent of a Rembrandt or a Monet. Um, but the way it was treated in the 1950s, I don't know if you can see it quite here in this slide, but they tacked uh, letters, uh, they pasted letters and numbers right onto the actual um, painting. <laughs> and, and so well, we're gonna start caring for this uh, pretty soon, it's gonna come down and uh, we'll do our best to restore it. But this is the way that, that in the 1950s, it was thought it was okay. Just as you heard from Phil, it was okay to, to just re, you know, excavate where people thought that was worth excavating. It was okay to put up um, Native American art or Native American objects without context, without thinking, and without consulting with the native peoples themselves because the thought was, well, what would they know? They're about to die. And so this whole you know, way of thinking had to change. And so now it is changing. And so this is the time to tell new stories um, and to redo this hall. And there's a couple of reasons why this is a particularly exciting time. First of all, Native peoples themselves are in the midst of a real resurgence and revitalization. There's lots of, as you heard from Chief K. Rhodes, there's language revitalization going on. There's a huge um, fluorescence of uh, contemporary Native American artists. There's a really good cadre now of uh, Native American scholars and museum professionals who are working in this field, who are, have written really important work about how you know, Native peoples can and should be thought about in both in the past and in the present and into the future. So there's a lot of rich material that we can work with. And, um, so th and there's a growing interest among non-Native peoples to really understand history and culture today of Native Americans. And so we did a survey at the Field Museum um, to think to, when we were thinking about what hall would we now renovate? And everyone at the museum's exhibition department thought, oh, Egypt, it's gonna be Egypt. People will wanna know the most about Egypt. And it turns out that was not true. The hall that people most wanted us to renovate was the Native North American Hall. Uh, because they said, this is a history we don't know. We want to know more about Native North Americans. And so and I think that's why the, the Tribune put the story about our uh, renovation on the front page. There's this real um, desire to, to know more. So that's a good thing. So the approach that we're taking as we go forward now is to place collaboration at the center of this renovation. Um, because as you've heard all morning, it does not make sense to think that, mean that we know it all and that, that somehow we can tell the best story as a field museum. 
it makes more sense to think that by bringing in diverse perspectives and stories of, from Native perspectives themselves, that we will be able to present this much more richer, much more complex, much more in get compelling story of both contemporary life and what is the relationship between contemporary life today and the past. Because our objects speak to and are very powerful storytellers in and of themselves. But how do their stories, how do the stories of our object connect us to what is happening today? We can only do that by collaborating with, the, with Native uh, American scholars, professionals, and community members. So that's the new approach. Um, and I started doing some of this back in 2012 with um, contemporary Native American artists. We invited in contemporary artists to look at the collection, select pieces from the collection, and, and then pair them with their own works and create a whole new way of thinking about our collections through the lens of these contemporary artists. So the first one we worked with was Bunky Echo Hawk, who's Pawnee, and um, does a. you can look up his website. His work is really, um, it's got a sense of humor to it as well as uh, being really uh, powerful artwork. And then currently at the Field Museum until January 23rd, there are two other co-curated exhibits on display. One was with Rhonda Holy Bear, who's a Lakota artist who makes these very intricate uh, bead and quill work uh, figures. And the other is Chris Papan, who's a ledger artist and does uh, work on um, ledger paper uh, in the style of the plains, like in the style of Silverhorn, um, but it's 21st century ledger art. So this is uh, Rhonda's installation. And Chris's installation is right in that old hall that I showed you the pictures of before Chris's uh, work was up, but he's intervening in this hall to make the comment that, you know, this, that that hall is like the ledger paper. It's the old stuff. And he's putting, layering contemporary perspectives on the old stuff. So it's a very cool way for us while we're still in the process of thinking about the redevelopment to you know, get people to look at the objects in there in a different way. So in order to do this collaboration, we've um, com created, we assembled a, an amazing group of uh, advisors. They represent different uh, disciplines. There's historians, there's anthropologists, there's museum professionals. They come from different parts of the country, different tribal affiliations. Um, there's also uh, including local voice in the committee. So we have representation from the Pokagon Band and the Chicago Urban Community. And Eli's going to talk about that in a minute. And they are have started working with us from the very beginning. So it's not like we thought of what to do and then we've invited them to give us a stamp of approval. They're guiding us every step of the way on the content, the design, the educational materials, and how we should care for our collections, because that's a big part of how this is going to work going forward. So. Um, Here's the committee together with our staff at our first meeting. And here's, we put them to work. So they have to actually, um, they meet with us quarterly. And uh, right now we're at the uh, point where we're uh, doing what's called the bubble plan for the um, hall, which is to think about what are the big themes and messages that we're going to be talking about in that hall. What is really exciting, also new about this project, is that it's not going to be a permanent hall like our others that we put up and then it stays up for 50 years. So as you can see, science doesn't work that way. Science changes, stories change, 
you know, current life ways change, so you can't have a static hall. So what we're doing is creating a fluid space where displays will rotate periodically. And so there will be an opportunity to tell different stories all the time in that hall. And so that way, it not only will allow us to stay fresh, but also because we have such a big collection and so many stories can be told, it will allow us to continually tell different stories. Otherwise, how can we you know, think about representing 500, how many is it, 563? Yeah, 570, Some, 570, 570 tribes recognized by the federal government, and that's not to include all the ones that are not recognized. So we're really excited about the possibilities here and about the collaboration and the work ahead. And uh, the hall will be opening in the fall of 2021, but that will just be the beginning of the storytelling to come. And so, um, and the idea is that, you know, going forward from there, there will always be uh, an inclusion of different voices and different perspectives and different stories. So I'm gonna turn it over to Eli now to talk about the Chicago component because that's also another exciting part is that um, we are gonna, focus a good part of the hall on telling the Chicago story. Um, and that's a, a decision that was made by the advisory committee working with us to sort of f feature um, the Chicago region and, the, and uh, what's happening here in the hall. So <laughs> thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Eli Zakovich, and uh, I'm born and raised in Chicago, but I'm uh, also from the Little Shell Band of Chippewa Creek out of Montana. And I remember going to the museum as a little kid, and you know, looking at the displays, there was not a lot of Cree items, and I would ask my mom, how come this, where, where are we? You know, growing up, I would hear talk to other people, and they'd ask that question, where are we? And of course, my mom's response is, well, it's because we're Cree. We don't give our stuff away. You know, that was, she was being fun and cheap, but it was a real thing. When missionaries and up in Canada, you'd have uh, government agents, they'd come and take stuff. So either you destroyed it, or you hid it, or you did something with it. And I think there was uh, this idea that if your stuff wasn't in the museum, then you won. So, well, what items were there? And it's funny, is there were a lot of sacred items that were on display. And my mom, I remember there was an offering uh, container, it was a bear skull that was nailed to the wall. You know, and my mom would say that shouldn't be in there because it's supposed to fall apart. And so she would start, she would take that object and she'd start telling my sister and I stories about similar things. You start telling stories when she was growing up, uh, community she lived in, family, and that's how one object would actually start. So we didn't really focus on all that, but we would learn a lot. But the thing is, if you didn't have a backstory, you didn't know. And I think for a lot of us in the community, we would go to the museum and we were happy to see a lot of stuff, but there was never that story. So, I think it's a good honor, and I thank Alka for bringing me on board. Uh, one of the things that the museum has done is actually hired a lot more Native staff. Uh, I remember being a student, uh, interning in the Bone Lab, working on Anton mummies, and there was, I think, what, one? Yeah. One Native in the entire museum, and they found each other, of course. So, but I remember that was when NACPRO, that was maybe about five years after NACPRO was uh, initiated, and you know, it was interesting to be made in the museum at that time. Uh, but I would say a lot has changed, and one thing that always I think I find amazing still, and a lot of us in the community, I know in the community, is that people from outside our community will say, you have to talk about Chicago. 
And I remember when the Smithsonian came in, they arrived at the American Museum. This is our past center. Uh, this is the third building we lived in. We are now in a new building. Uh, but in this hall, we met with folks from the NMAI, and they said, we've talked to Native experts and communities, and they said, you have to talk about Chicago. And we were really amazed, like, why Chicago? Just a city, just a community of many tribes. And sometimes you don't know how unique you are until someone else notices. And so if you notice the flags and why I chose this picture, this is just some of the flags of community members. And even at our new center, we still hang our flags where we're from. So when you walk in there, you say, who is the Chicago American Indian community? We're probably some 200 plus different tribes that somehow come together for different services. And we have the American Indian Center, which this is the oldest multi-tribal urban Indian center in the United States. Now I say multi-tribal because Phoenix is about a year older than us, but it was mostly Diné. So it's a proud distinction. And when I look at Chicago's past, there's a lot of research done on the community. Uh, our current, this current project with the museum is nothing new. Uh, the community, people have come to Chicago to learn about urban Indians. They want to know what are the effects of urbanization. And, but what makes this project really interesting is there's a real emphasis on what is your story. You know, in the past, museums would create exhibits and they would define the story and you had to kind of fit in. Um, or objects would be the main focus. And what's interesting with this project is its themes. So, the other thing that comes up too, and, you know, we've heard a lot of land recognitions and acknowledgements, and something that I thought was really interesting is a great emphasis of place. And for a lot of staff at the museum and our advisors, felt that because the museum sits in Chicago, Chicago should be a prominent uh, focus. So as the person who has to kind of sort this out, I think great. We have 8,000 years of history to tangle with. And I say 8,000 because it's something when we think of telling stories, often urban Indians, we begin in 1950 with relocation program, and it's a program. It was never an act or a law. Um, it was an experiment. At that time, there was other experiments, which was, you know, in the case of uh, Native children, by taking them away from their parents and putting them with non-Native families to see, and this also happened with African-American children, to see if they would become white if they separated them from their families. Relocation was kind of the same idea. Um, if you take Native people off the reservation and give them jobs and make sure they don't come back, will reservations still exist? How do you depopulate the land? So when we talk about Indian, the Indian Removal Act and all that, it never really stops. Um, but Chicago was unique, and I always like, I think Chicago is a good example of where these policies failed. So one thing with this exhibit, something we've been talking about, is there's no, not a sense of linear time. So we're going to move through time and place, and whatever is required to tell that story. So something I think about, and I, have a, I work with the developers, and my colleague Miranda Owens also, we work with the developers, and uh, So we work with developers, we work with different folks on kind of helping how do we ground this exhibit. So one of the things we came up or uh, talked a little bit about is maintaining native voice. And Chicago, from a political sense, from a cultural sense, has always maintained a strong native voice. Um, it's also a long-established community and native presence 
And then the big problem is how do we define Chicago? So we'll start with boys. So I have a few pictures up here of some significant people and some contemporary examples of boys. And one of the things when we talk about this region and Indian removal in Chicago, they always say 1837 is when the Indians left. But in fact, it's not necessarily true. In fact, even after 1837, Native voice was strong, it was prominent, and it was involved in the planning of the city. A lot of people don't know that when the Anishinaabe, the Potawatomi, were living in Chicago at the time, and those villages, by the way, were not just one tribe. Many of the Anishinaabe communities were led by Miami, Odawa, Menominees, Ho-Chunks living in these communities, Sac and Fox. They were multi-tribal villages. And when the Easterners were coming in, the Anglo settlers were coming in, there was an understanding that, okay, they're coming. There had been Indian revolts prior. A lot of them had failed. So the Anishinaabek thought, well, why do we have to move? Why can't we work with these people? And so they did something really different. And they said, we're not going to fight with the Americans, but we're going to say, how do we, settlers and power, build a city? And the thing that is, Chicago has always been an urban area. When the Anishinaabek arrived, they were greeted by the Miami, who were already living in these, uh, this area. The Miami came, they were greeted by the Ho-Chunk. These village sites, they find that we think of the Chicago neighborhoods like Bowmanville and Lincoln Park were already well-established urban centers. When we think about Chicago, there was trade. There were tribal representatives from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up from Northern Canada. This was, it was a very active area. And I think in some ways, in some ways when we think of why Chicago is important, because in this a little area, it's a microcosm of what's going on in the country. <coughs> throughout the United States, throughout Canada, throughout Mexico, Latin America. Um, but one thing that was never lacking was voice. No one was silent. And, you know, in 1816, the Treaty of St. Louis, a lot of Ho-Chunk were removed from this area. But you know what, they weren't removed, because a lot of families said, we're coming back. We're not leaving. And they made it a point. Some of them came to the Potawatomi villages, others just went back to their homes. When the uh, Treaty of 1833, Chicago Treaty, the last session treaty, you know, after Egypt, you know, he said, we're not giving up any more land, we're not leaving. Of course, you know, the Michigan Territory had a different set of uh, ideas, and at that, what they don't tell you, on September 26, 1833, after those treaty negotiations had ended, the surrounding that treaty camp was a ring of cannons. And Governor Porter of the Michigan Territory said, you know, his response to the Potawatomi, who said they weren't going to leave, was, well, whatever old victory wants, he's going to get. And September 26th is the day we don't celebrate Chicago. In fact, it's a forgotten day, but that's the day when that treaty was signed. So where the bottom of the you didn't know. A lot of tribes today get business committees. And the origin of the business committee comes out of that treaty. It comes out of a group of 80 <coughs> chiefs that said, okay, we're gonna, how do we fight this? The Treaty of 1833 is the most expensive treaty the United States has ever engaged in. And that was because the Potawatomi knew how to work the system. Some families found that they could keep their land if they took a fee simple deed. So up along the Des Plaines River, a lot of Potawatomi families said, wait, so if we're, quote, Christian, and we take a deed, we can stay. So they stayed. 
And that Explains River, Potawatomi community, was long and well active up until the 1950s. They refused to leave. Uh, one of the Okamam, Chibingwe Noman, who's Odawa, or leader, you may know him as Alexander Robinson, he figured out, because the Potawatomi in Chicago were also an infantry unit, they would figure out how do we, he found out that veterans get land. So he went to President Tyler and said, how can I keep my reservation? A lot of them, when they say there are no reservations in Illinois, Alex, there were about 80 to about 100 of them. But Robinson kept his reservation by an executive order. And on the Displains River, he used that. And there was a community of Potawatomi and Miami and Menominees uh, and even ho who stayed and they lived there. They defied the system. And they say, you know, a year before Robinson died, he got to watch Chicago burn down. Knowing that he had won. All right, so along with, we have Simon Pokagan up there, who's uh, another group, Leopold Pokagan, they refused to leave. But Simon came, when we talk about the museum's history, to the 18. Uh, World's Columbian Exposition. He came and he wrote the Red Man's Rebuke. And at a time when Native people were supposed to be pushed away, his voice carried through and said, no, we're still here, we're not going anywhere. His son, Roger Williams, would later sue the city of Chicago to reclaim Lakeville area. And in fact, the land that the museum sits on is part of that Lakeville. And next in is Carlos Montezuma, who had gone to the boarding schools, but he went to uh, Northwestern University, became a stomach surgeon, became one of the biggest activists uh, for Native rights. He helped found the Society of American Indians, which was a national uh, organization, and in Chicago he founded the Indian Fellowship League, which brought Native and non-Native supporters, created networking, and when we think about the American Indian Center that you just saw, that center exists because of that activism and their voice. And with the pipelines, we're still fighting. And Robust Indigenes is a program that the American Indian Center puts on in which community members tell those stories and keep that voice going. We have a long established community here. Um, this is our old center and our, over at our roof center. As I said, there hasn't been, this area has never been lack of Native presence. There's always been Native people here. In Chicago, we had all the men who were pop up. We had businesses set up. We had uh, long-standing residences, uh, you name it. And the amount of tribal diversity is pretty amazing. We have tribes from all over. And I say all over, I mean all over the Americas that end up in Chicago. So thinking about why is Chicago important because at some point everybody ends up in this city and now comes the harder task of how do you tell that story. And the nice thing about having rotation with rotating exhibitions, we can tell those stories. So there's kids that aren't going to say, well, where are we? We are there. We're going to be in there. It's, uh, I don't know, pretty, I'm still kind of choked up about it. It's like, you know, Alec always wants me to be very scientific. scientific, but, you know, when no one has asked you to be a part of something for so long, and then now they want your opinion, you know, and I don't know if everybody always wants to hear the opinions, <laughs> but, but, you know, it's kind of hard for people to take, and I've noticed in this just the first year of the project, it's been... It's taken time for folks in the shower community just to like really wrap their heads around. This isn't something that's just, oh, it's in three years and we're done with you. This is, we start now and we're not going to stop. So I'm excited. Um, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. And in three years, we'll probably have more work to do. But uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's just amazing. I'm sorry, it's just really 
Well, we're lucky to have you, Eli, working with us. So. Thank you. It's on Ainsley and Kimball in Albany Park, so right at Lawrence and Kimball. Um, it's, uh, you can kind of see here in front right there, it's a very sort of 1950s modern building. So. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> Okay, so this is a good question. The question is, when is the current exhibit going to be closed so that the new exhibit can be built? And the, the hall itself is actually, we can never close the whole hall because it's a thoroughfare between the main Stanley Field Hall and the Northwest Coast Hall. And so there will always be something going on. Um, you know, uh, and you'll actually get to watch the transformation of the hall in process, in progress. So um, we've deinstalled 300 of the 1,400 artifacts already, and some of them are being conserved in what's called the Ravenstein Lab, which is in the Pacific Hall on the second floor of the museum. So you can actually watch our conservators uh, start to take care of these objects and help put them to rest now for a little bit. They have to rest. They've been on display for 60 years. So, yeah, it's exciting. It's a good time to come. Just putting in a plug there. Okay. You never defined your definition of the Chicago area. Because I'm trying to avoid that. So if we go to the next slide. So this was the uh, Sharp map. Many of you probably have seen this. This is uh, Albrecht Sharp, who is an amazing fellow because he got on his bicycle with a surveyor's chain and surveyed most of northeastern Illinois uh, with very detailed notes. But it's a good question. It's something we're still, I don't know if we've really defined because what does Chicago mean? I mean, are we defined by our river systems? Which in that case, that brings Chicago all the way out here, right? If we think about where people come from and people have moved, well, we have a lot of people from Arizona, Montana, Oklahoma, California moved to Chicago, and maybe their kids moved elsewhere, but Chicago is still part of that story. Uh, I think. Functionally speaking, it's probably, I, I think of it as just one of the greater Great Lakes. Because it's, and it's something when we think about who has lived and still lives, is a lot of people that have been through here. And uh, I think one of our community members, John Dobbs, Ho-Chunk, you know, someone said, oh, well, Ho-Chunks were removed. He said, yeah, but we're still here. <laughs> we haven't left. And I think that's something to tackle too, is when we say Chicago, it's not just physical presence, but it's also what's in people's hearts and minds. Um, you know, do you truly leave home? And for a lot of people, I think of uh, Angie DeCora, who's uh, one of our elders who passed away years ago. Her family were a group of Ho-Chunks along with the signs who said, you know what, we're leaving Wisconsin, we're going home. And it's something about Chicago's home. So now we have to find what is home. But I think that's something we'll work on. And we've got a lot of, I would say our advisors, we have yeah. a good Great Lakes representation. So I'm going to put some work on them to also <laughs> help with that. But it is, it's a good question because is Chicago just a city? Or is it a place? Is it a state of mind? Is it a place you connect it to? Oh. Is the Potawatomi Indian originally from Illinois? So when I talk to my Miami friends, they say we remember the time when they arrived. <laughs> and uh, what that is is because while they were Potawatomi with the Haudenosaunee as their state expansion pushed out, it displaced a lot of people. And when we think of like the Illini Confederacy, it isn't just Algonquin speaking, but they're also one and dot people. When the Haudenosaunee 
Islamic State was created, it pushed a lot of people around. And when I talk to my Bochamp colleagues, they'll say, like, well, we remember when they all came. <laughs> you know? So it's, and I, but I think the thing is, people still have a connection to it. And it's interesting with the Potawatomi Bill, you can say there is a deep connection here. And uh, even Odawa up in Michigan, you know, up in Michigan will say Chicago was a special place because people came here to hunt, they came there to trade, to pass through. So it's, it's kind of hard. Everybody has a Chicago a deep-rooted sense of Chicago. And that, I think, will be interesting to see how that works out in this process. Yeah, just following up on that to kind of connect from this morning's presentations, what you heard from Phil and Tim and Leslie, you know, this notion that somehow prior to European arrival, people were static, that is completely wrong, right? And we know, if you even think, think for a minute about corn. Uh, corn was domesticated, as far as we know, somewhere in Mexico. And, but within like three, 3,000 years, Phil, or so, of its domestication, it's all the way into Canada and all the way to the Andes, right? How did it do that? didn't just travel by itself, people moved it. And so this idea that, you know, this was this dynamic landscape, the Americas, you know, across the entire two continents, people were moving, people were changing, people were encountering each other. And that continues to be the story of the Americas today. And so understanding that incredible creativity uh, and the way that people shaped each other and, and shaped our landscape. It's so critical to understanding why we want to preserve, conserve the prairies and the wetlands and the woodlands that we have. How, do, how does that continue to play a role in the health and well-being of our urban society, of our rural society? So I think you know, that's the continuity, that's the beauty of the story that we can tell at the Field Museum, is that it wasn't ever about these people were here and those people were there. It's always been about people encountering each other. Yes. Um, in, in the 1970s in Chicago, you were in the center was in uptown, there was the feeling that it was under siege and eventually you were going to be driven out, actually the Native Americans were going to be driven out because you didn't belong there. Oh. Where did that feeling begin to change? So when the center moved to Wilson Avenue, it was the Ravens of the Sonic Lodge was a big donor and they gave that building uh, to, the, the, to the center. One of the interesting things about the American Indian Center is that because it was created by Native people for Native people, it was actually considered, legally speaking, Native land. And in fact, I remember that Chicago police were not allowed to set foot in the center without permission. That only BIA police or federal police could go in. Um, but that was when they moved to Wilson, uh, Olderman was the alderman at the time, did not want an answer. He wanted, to, you know, he was looking at condos. He didn't want those people. And so we had a rough time moving there. And his successor, uh, Schulter, same thing. How do we get the Indians out of here? Uh, until, 1990 census when there was about, they found there were 75,000 American Indians living in Illinois, which by the way is a voting block, then that's when it changed. <laughs> it's, uh, unfortunately, it's, you know, I would say but maybe about the mid-80s, it really stopped um, because it's a community center and I think a lot of people, a lot of our neighbors, I know growing up in the 70s, they, there was a lot of 
slurs and stuff, but by the 80s, 90s, they kind of changed. Um, and I think just as people moved out or new people came in, um, I think also we weren't as invisible in the 90s. That whole like 500 year Columbus thing, and everybody realizes maybe they're, they're still here. That I think changed a lot of the attitudes. Um, but yeah, it's something, you know, in Chicago we've always dealt with, but we've also fought against it. And I think that's where that having that strong voice, um, reminding that we're not like any other community. We are a sovereign people. We have rights. Um, and now sometimes people don't want to hear that, but we're going to tell them. So. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.